the Judaizers desire the Galatians to move from Christ back to the law. So what does the Apostle Paul do? He selects three texts taken from the law to refute their thinking. So here's the question today. What does the law have to say about the law? D.L. Moody relayed the story about a man who did not desire to serve in Napoleon Bonaparte's army. He was drafted. However, a friend volunteered to take his place. The substitution made, and sometime later the substitute sadly was killed in battle. The same young man who was originally drafted was drafted again by mistake. He told the officers of the draft board, you can't take me. I'm dead. I died on the battlefield. The officers of the draft board argued that they could see the man was alive because he stood in front of him. The man drafted a second time said, if you look on the roll, you will find the record of a man's death. Sure enough, there on the roll was both the man who was originally drafted and the substitute. The case finally came before Napoleon himself. After examining the evidence, he said, Through a substitute, this man has not only fought, but has died in his country's service. No man can die more than once. Therefore, the law has no claim on him. Clearly, the man had a recognized legal substitute for him. Jesus Christ has become our substitute. Turn with me to the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 3. And as you're flipping to Galatians chapter 3, let me hurl two questions at you. Number one, how can an individual be freed from the curse of the law? And then the second question, what happens when you are freed from the curse of the law? Galatians chapter 3, I'll read to you verses 10 through 14. For as many as are of the works of the law or under the curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Let's pray together. Father, I, I thank you for our section in Galatians, showing us how to be justified, and it is through faith in Christ alone. Once again, may your spirit be our guide. Help us to understand this passage as Paul wrote it originally to these Galatian saints. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Judaizers promoted a law-based salvation. But they probably dismissed what had happened with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. Remember, that is the time that the scripture teaches that Abraham believed in the Lord and it was accounted to him for righteousness. That is, if you will, when he is declared saved. But that happened before the law. So most likely... These Judaizers came and said, well, yeah, that was probably true of Abraham being saved, but now the law is given, and we need to maintain the law in order to be saved. So what does Paul do via the inspiration of the Spirit of God? He goes to the law, and he's going to give us three key passages from the law itself showing that the law cannot save. 
but it is through faith. Notice in verse 10, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Let's unpack this together, beginning with the word for. It begins the explanation why keeping the law does not save. This builds upon what he had previously taught from chapter 3 and verses 6 through 9, showing Abraham as the example of faith. And notice here it's as many as. All those who want to merit their salvation through the law are being addressed. See, as many as are of the works of the law. That's a contrast, by the way, because back in chapter 3 and verse 7, it spoke of those ek pisteos of faith. And then in chapter 3 and verse 9, ek pisteos of faith. But now we have ex ergon of works, a clear contrast between those who are desiring to be saved through the works of the law versus through faith. All those, everyone who is going to the law for salvation are under the curse. And that word under, the preposition, is significantly used by the Apostle Paul. Later on, we're going to see those who are under sin, chapter 3 and verse 22. And then in chapter 3 and verse 25, those who are under a tutor. And then in chapter 4 and verse 2, under guardians and stewards. And then in chapter 4 and verse 3, under the elements of the world. Here, we're looking at those who are under the curse. The curse is ancient, is it not? When Satan slithered into the Garden of Eden, enticed Adam and Eve, and then they disobeyed God, when God came and addressed Satan, put him under a curse. But also creation itself was put under a curse. Our first quote is now going to be given to us from the three significant Old Testament passages Paul picks from, from the law. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. The quote from Deuteronomy 27, 26. This is one you want to mark down. You need to note these quotes that come directly from the law. Deuteronomy chapter 27 and verse 26. Paul speaks about those that are cursed who are seeking to what? Continue. That means to maintain at all times the law. See, that's impossible. But the all things, you cannot pick and choose. You cannot select out of the 613 commandments given in the first five books of the Old Testament alone, which ones you will keep and which ones you will not keep. To continue in all things, but notice here, to do. If you're going to choose the law as your standard, you have to continue in all things and do them. Impossible. Impossible. What is the standard, by the way? Jesus himself in the Sermon of the Mount says, and I'll give you to King James, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. The standard, perfection. Now, there is nothing wrong with the law itself. Turn with me to Romans chapter 7. Book of Romans chapter 7. And if you would track down to verse 12, Romans chapter 7, verse 12, therefore the law is, give me the word, holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Clearly, there is nothing wrong with the law. The law is good. Where does the problem lie? Two verses later, Romans chapter 7 in verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. The issue is not the law because the law is holy. The problem is with you and me. We do not have the ability to keep the Old Testament law perfectly. So we learn about this from the Old Testament, 
Deuteronomy 27, 26, and James picks up on this, as you're aware, in James chapter 2 in verse 10. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, what is he guilty of? He's guilty of all. Now, look at verse 11, and we have at the beginning of the verse an adversative, a contrast. You'll notice the word but. The but is going to show the contrast of those who are trying to maintain the law with that of faith. Uh, Paul uh, says, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. It's clear for all to see. And uh, observe the words, no one. No, not one is the idea from the Greek. Paul picks a strategic verse. Now, this one does not derive from the first five books of the Old Testament, but from the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2 in verse 4. That quote from Habakkuk 2.4 occurs not only here in Galatians 3.11, but in Romans 1.17, and then also in Hebrews chapter 10 in verse 38. Now, the original context, Habakkuk, a prophet, is very disturbed because God is not judging the southern kingdom of Judah, who are given to violence and injustice. So he cries out to God. This is Habakkuk chapter 1. God, why are you permitting our people to sin like this? And God says, well, I'm going to tell you the remedy. I'm going to send in the Babylonians who will chasten my people. And then (laughs) the prophet has a problem because he says, Lord, how can you use a people more wicked than our own people to judge us? And the response comes back from chapter 2 in verse 4, the just, see all those that are declared righteous, shall live by faith. The point that Paul is making here, whether you're looking at the Old Testament or coming into the New Testament, faith is the means to be brought into a right relationship with God. Verse 12, yet he says the law is not of faith. Another contrast. We have faith in verse 11, once again turning to the law. This is the second significant quote from the Pentateuch. This comes from Leviticus chapter 18 in verse 5. And here Paul pens, given a quote, the man who does them shall live by them. Again, what does the law demand? Perfection. So if you're going to choose to forget grace, forget faith in Christ alone, and go back to the law, then you need to be 100% perfect, which is impossible. As Paul, in the book of Romans, is expressing that all people are sinners, beginning in 118, all the way through the chapter 3 and verse 20 in Romans. This is how he concludes that section in Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Clearly, no one can keep, maintain the law perfectly. What is the law? It's a mirror. It is to show you just how sinful you are. It is not given in order to bring salvation, but it's a mirror to demonstrate to the people just their imperfection, because there would be one who would come that was perfect, that could maintain the law perfectly, and then fulfill the law. So here's our first point. Believe in Jesus to be freed from the law's curse. Notice the emphasis on faith. Believe in Jesus to be freed from the law's curse. This point derives from verses 10 through 12. Again, what's the standard, everybody? that Jesus himself gives, Matthew 5, 48. You need to be perfect and the standard, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So now we have the law. It's given. It's 
showing everyone just how sinful he or she is. And it demonstrates that no one has the ability to keep the law. Christ comes upon the scene. And in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17, Jesus himself says, I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Our Lord Jesus lived a perfect life. He had never sinned, fulfills the law perfectly. And that's why Paul could pen about him in 2 Corinthians 5.21, the one who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ, maintaining the law perfectly, didn't destroy the law, didn't obliterate the law, fulfilled it. Therefore, when he went to the cross and he died on the cross as our substitute, taking our place, the wrath of God being poured out on the Son, Jesus through his perfect life and perfect death, fulfilled the law. And when we come to Jesus by faith, knowing that he lived a perfect life, he died the perfect death as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, conquered death three days later, God sees us as fulfilling the law through him. Point number two. Belief in Christ, our substitute, removes the law's curse and blesses us through Abraham, granting us the Spirit. I know it's a long point, so I'll say it a second time. Belief in Christ, our substitute, removes the law's curse and blesses us through Abraham, granting us the Spirit. And the second point derives from verses 13 and 14. Notice the first word in verse 13, Christ. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Christ is emphatic, not only because it's placed first in the Greek sentence, but there is no connecting particle or conjunction. He stands out. Christ is the one who has redeemed us. Redeemed to buy out from. It was used, this term, in the first century of buying a slave's freedom. And that's the concept that we have here. Christ has redeemed us, not referring to just Jews, but also to Gentiles also. Each one who comes to Christ Understanding what he has done for them. (laughs) Jesus takes our place beautifully and then redeems us, but he does it from what? The curse of the law. The curse of the law, for it is written. Here comes our third quote from the Pentateuch. This one derives from Deuteronomy. Chapter 21 in verse 23. Deuteronomy 21, 23. Christ himself is described as becoming a curse. Only Jesus could appease the wrath of God. The term propitiation. Christ came. God is a just God, and he has to punish sinners. He would not be God if he didn't have a sense of justice. His very nature is just. The Old Testament says the soul that sins, it must die. Isaiah reveals that it's our sin that has separated us from God. So how could the wrath of the Father that is currently being poured out on the world. We learn that from John 3, 36, that the wrath of God, if you will, is currently being poured out on each sinner. So here comes Jesus. And in the Old Testament, when an individual had committed a capital offense, 
for instance, adultery, premeditated murder. That individual was stoned, stoned to death. And then that body was taken and placed, hung upon a tree as an example of God's judgment upon the person. This is how Paul depicts Jesus. He takes the wrath of God upon himself. Listen to what Isaiah writes 700 years before Jesus is born of a virgin. This is Isaiah 53 in verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Jesus, our substitute, appeases the wrath of God because he and he alone fulfilled the law perfectly. Remember when Jesus is on the cross? Recall what he cries out? Eli, Eli, lama sambachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Holy Father, if you will, who cannot look upon sin, turns his back for that moment. Remember the, the darkness from noon to three that hovered over the cross? Why? What a depiction of the wrath of God being placed upon his own son. And Jesus satisfies God's demand for justice through the death of Jesus Christ, who became our substitute. Let me read those words again. Please let them settle in your minds. Isaiah 53, 4. Surely he, Jesus, has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by whom? smitten by God and afflicted. I trust that you have a sense of appreciation for what Jesus did for you and me by stepping in to time. Isn't that exactly what he did? Galatians 4.4, 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. Jesus's timing was perfect. He was born of a woman, and he came under the system of what? Law. That's who our Lord Jesus is. And in verse 14, Paul gives us two, two purpose statements. We see each one introduced by the word that. Let me read this to you, and then I'll unpack it for you. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. Here's our second that. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. First of all, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in whom? In Christ Jesus. Remember when the dots were connected by Paul? He took us back to Genesis chapter 12. In verse 3, I will bless those who bless thee, Abram, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, Abram, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So there is Abraham. God called him from a pagan people. He would become the father of faith, the patriarch of the Jewish nation. And the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would come from his line. So we have in Galatians 3.8, And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, how? By faith, preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. And then Paul says, So then. Those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So we get the dots connected, going from Abraham to the Messiah, fulfilling the law, and the gospel is made available not just to the Jewish people, but to the Gentiles as well. And anyone who comes to the Lord by faith, placing their trust, their reliance, 
upon Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice, who led the perfect life, fulfilled the law, died, conquered death, ascended to the right hand of the Father, sat down showing the work is done. When you trust in him and him alone, our substitute, that is when we are born again, born from above, born a second time. So Paul gives us now the second that, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The promise of the Spirit through faith. Remember Paul's earlier questions beginning Galatians chapter 3? He was concerned about the Galatians because they were being instructed by the Judaizers to go back to the law. And this is what Paul wrote in chapter 3 and verse 2. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? In essence, did you get saved through the works of the law? No, it was by faith. And then the Spirit of God came to take up residence in them. We have the promise of the Spirit. Jesus did not want to leave his disciples as orphans. So as the Father sent the Son, so then as Jesus leaves, he gives a promise that he would dispatch the Spirit of God. And on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God came and then took up residence permanently in each person that believed on Christ. Listen now to what Jesus says in Acts 1-4. And being assembled together with them, this is the disciples at the Mount of Olives just before Jesus ascends to the right hand of God, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. Then also, in Luke chapter 24, In verse 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father unto you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Jesus was going to send a helper that was like him. The eternal third person of the Trinity would be dispatched through the Father and Son to each one that placed faith in Jesus Christ to take up residence, to stay within the believer, to be our comforter, to be our guide. He actually is called the spirit of truth, the one that would lead us into all truth. He's the one who gives us the internal witness that we are saved, according to Romans chapter 8. He bears witness with our human spirit that we are children of God and also heirs. That's the indwelling spirit of God. Did not come by maintaining the works of the law, but it was by having faith in the finished work of Christ. Consider Galatians chapter 3. In verse 26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Do you marvel that Jesus lived 30 some years and that when he goes to the cross, having only ministered for three and a half years, think about this, in his 30s, I imagine a lot of people could say, oh, he was cut off way too soon. But in John 19, in verse 30, he cries out to Telestai. It is finished, the concept of paid in full. He had finished the work. Imagine, here is the Lord Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, into a family, and his brothers were not believing on him. John chapter 7 and verse 5, he came to his own people, the Jews. And we're told that he came to his own in John 1, and his own did not receive him. 
at a point in time, even on the cross, he is rejected, if you will, <laughs> at least temporarily, because upon the Son was the sin of the world placed, and the Father had to turn his back, if you will, upon the Son, because he bore your sin and my sin, not just the sin of the elect, but the sin of the world. He's the propitiation, as First John 2 says, not only for our sin, but also for the sin of the world. What an enormous sacrifice the Son had made in order that you and I could be born again and then have the sweet Spirit of God come to live within our life. But what did Jesus do for us? Point number one, believe in Jesus to be freed from the law's curse. If you choose to go the route of keeping the law, you're in trouble. Do you really think for one moment that you can keep the Ten Commandments perfectly? How about the 613 that are in the first five books of the Old Testament? It's impossible. And that is why Paul gives us those three quotes showing that if you want to go the route of keeping the law, you need to keep it perfectly, which is impossible. Romans 3.20 For by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. You believe in Jesus, the keeper of the law, God's perfect sacrifice. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. A lamb being a substitute. As the lamb was a substitute, going back to the Exodus, And as lambs have been sacrificed by the Jewish people for thousands of years, we have now the Lamb of God who takes away the law's curse. Believe in him. Put your faith in the one. And by the way, faith is your key term. That's what we have in the Gospel of John. Almost 100 times, the emphasis is to believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The moment you believe, God declares you righteous, as God had declared Abraham righteous in Genesis 15, 6. And for us, we are freed from the law's curse, because Jesus had taken the curse of the law by hanging on the tree, you get the point, satisfying the wrath of God for you and me. And then our second point, belief in Christ, our substitute, removes the law's curse and blesses us through Abraham, granting us the Spirit. That's remarkable. When did Abraham live? Approximately 2,000 years before Jesus was born of a virgin. God gave to Abraham a promise And Abraham embraced the promise. The standard has always been the same. The just shall live by faith. And without faith, Hebrews 11, 6, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So the promise given to Abraham And what did he do with it? He believed God. And what did God put into Abram's account? Righteousness. This has always been the way of God. It's never been through works for salvation. Salvation is not of works, lest anyone should boast. Rather, it comes through the finished work, the finished perfect work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then what does God do for us when we exhibit faith in that completed work? He grants us the Holy Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one Spirit we have all been baptized into the body of Christ. The baptism there is a spirit baptism, which associates or identifies us with believers, the universal church. What an extraordinary thing. So we're baptized. We are indwelt. Spirit of God comes and does not leave us as David had sinned and was fearful because he had seen what happened when the spirit departed from Saul and he became a madman. David says, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. The spirit of God is given to us as salvation. We are sealed 
with the Holy Spirit of promise, according to Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. And we are sealed, God's mark of ownership and authenticity, until the day of redemption. That's Ephesians 4, 30. God takes the Holy Spirit and he seals us, puts him within us to remain with us until death. Or when Jesus Christ comes back for us, that same spirit is the one who fills us. Ephesians 5 says, don't be drunk with wine in which is excess, but be filled or controlled with the spirit. And there are evidence of being spirit filled. We have joy. We have thankfulness. We have submissiveness. That all comes through being filled with the spirit. And then we are led by the spirit. We're told in Romans 8, 14, that is the case as well. And God is always interested. So when we put our faith in Christ, the law's curse is removed. We are blessed through Abraham and we are given the Holy Spirit of God. (laughs) What, What a blessing to understand and apply these things because of what Jesus, our substitute, has done. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are a blessed people indeed, and I thank you that through your Son, the law's curse is removed from each one that places faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for not only saving our souls, thank you for depositing the Holy Spirit within that we are blessed, we are blessed, Lord, like Abraham of old, and even to a greater degree because of the spirit that stays with us until the day of redemption. We thank you, Lord, for these truths in Jesus' name. Amen.